Well, BBC Wales on One profiles one of the century's most enduring screen legends now, Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. President. One of the most famous stars in Hollywood history is dead at 36. Marilyn Monroe was found dead in bed. These images tell the dark side of her story. The rumored affairs, the failures, the lonely death. But too easily forgotten is the other side that reveals a very different woman. Her name was Marilyn Monroe, and her life was the stuff of legend. I think that she'll always be with us as long as we have pieces of celluloid that show uh, her uh, performances. And I think that, too, that she's embodied in a spirit that was quite marvelous. In fact, she is the only one that 20-some-odd years after her death still sells books, magazines. So obviously, it indicates that there was something unique and special about her. What? makes Marilyn Monroe. Why is she still a, mem a live member of our talk all the time? It has nothing to do with the scandal of her death. It's because she's the most talented motion picture actress alive in her day. Hollywood, the town where she was born. Even today, her presence is everywhere. Hollywood where legends are made and worshipped. And even the most treasured among them can be defiled. What about her was so fascinating? At 16, she was just another young bride. One of her husband's friends was Robert Mitchum. When I first met Marilyn, she was Norma Jean Baker, Norma Jean Doherty, as a matter of fact, at that time. And I was working at Lockheed. Jim Doherty was my partner, and he had a picture of his bride. And she was very shy and very pleasant, very sweet. But uh, she was uh, not too comfortable around people, because I suppose her background hadn't prepared her for sort of uh, easy sociality. Norma Jean Baker was born in 1926. Her mother was in and out of mental hospitals, and she was raised by strangers in an orphanage and nine foster homes. She never knew her father. Though seldom alone, she was always lonely, dreaming of the day it would all be different. The war abruptly ended Norma Jean's life as a suburban housewife. Jim Doherty joined the Merchant Marine, and Norma Jean felt abandoned once more. She took a job at a local factory where a photographer spotted her. The rest is history. It was in 1946, Mrs. Snively had a little agency. She called and she said, I have a girl, and I think she's, she might be interesting. So I said, send her over. So a girl came in, nice, but nothing great. So I made some tests of her. From that time on, I used her for years. She had one bad front tooth, which I had fixed at my expense. Her hair was kinky, which someone else fixed. Uh, but she, she was a very good model. I had her on easily a hundred magazine covers. Her face and figure was well known long before she became Marilyn Monroe. She was convinced that she was not terribly pretty or sexy, really, you know. And as a matter of fact, she did not, she didn't have an aura of sexiness about her. But when she saw a camera, any camera, she lit up and was totally different. The moment the shot was over, she fell back into her 
not very interesting position. And I don't know how to explain that, but that's what makes a good model. She always talked about becoming an actress, but then every model wants to become an actress. This is the first car I ever owned. I call her Cynthia. She's going to have the best care a car ever had. Put Royal Triton in Cynthia's little tummy. Right, lady. Cynthia will just love that Royal Triton. In Hollywood, prerequisite was to be pretty and have a great body as Marilyn did. There were all kinds of photographers in this town ready to shoot you in your bikini, put you on the cover of magazines, which always turned out to be not the kind of magazines you wanted your mother to read. Um, and finally, if you made the grade and you got uh, signed to uh, be a contract player at one of the studios, that was heaven. They hired you if you made a lot of publicity. They were really looking at what was highly saleable. Norma Jean's contract with 20th Century Fox came in 1947, after her divorce from Jim Doherty. Part of her new packaging was a change of name, Marilyn Monroe. We were both very young and struggling. We used to sit in Schwab's drugstore and fantasize about the future. And both of us, uh, along with uh, having uh, glorious uh, careers and Oscars, of course, one of the perfect husband uh, with perfect children. Marilyn got her first role in Scudahoo, Scudahay. The studio pronounced her unphotogenic and cut out all recognizable shots of her. In the 1947 film, Dangerous Years, she didn't wind up on the cutting room floor, but the impact of her appearance was negligible. Six more all day Sundays. Where's Evie? Hi, Evie. Hi, small change. Hey, wait, I got money tonight. Am I gonna see you later? If I'm not too tired. But Evie, I thought we had a date. Look, this tray weighs a ton. After only two films, oh, Marilyn's contract was dropped. She first sang and danced the next year in Ladies of the Chorus for Columbia. She began working with an acting coach. It didn't help. Again, Marilyn was dropped. Marilyn had a walk-on part in the 1950 Love Happy with the Marx Brothers, and she made the most of it. Is there anything I can do for you? What a ridiculous statement. Mr. Grunion, I want you to help me. I have a little sand left. What seems to be the trouble? Some men are following me. Really? I can't understand why. That year, Clark Gordon, a classmate from the actor's lab, was at the same audition as Marilyn. <laughs> uh, I, I, I went to read with her, and I realized that she was so nervous, the script was shaking like a leaf. So I said to Marilyn, just grab my arm and hold on to it. And remember, with a microphone, you don't pay any attention to it. This is just a story about two young people sitting on the front porch deciding whether they're going to kiss each other. And uh, she grabbed my arm and uh, really sunk her fingernails into it. She was scared. And afterwards, in that wonderful, tremulous voice of hers, she said, oh, thank you so much. I, I don't know how I can... I can ever thank you. And I said, well, let's go across the street and have a cup of coffee at Coffee Dan's. And uh, she said that she had an opportunity to go out with Johnny Hyde on Tuesday night. And I said, listen, that's important. He's a big agent. I called Thursday morning, and evidently that night was the night that she decided to go up and live with Johnny Hyde. She... Uh respected intellect all the uh, I was busy going out with handsome uh, young movie stars she was attracted maybe father figures but certainly older men who were very smart super agent Johnny Hyde prevailed on John Houston to audition Marilyn for a part in the 1950 asphalt jungle 
It was her first major break. Since I'm going to be busy with a lot of cases, I thought you might like to take a trip. Where to? Oh, I don't know. The coast, Florida, anywhere you like. Could I, Uncle Lon? Anywhere? No fooling? Yes, I think a change of scenery might be good for you. Wait. You wait right here. I've got the most terrific idea. Oh, Cuba, that's not a bad idea. Imagine me on this beach here in my green bathing suit. Yikes. I almost fought a white one the other day, but it wasn't quite extreme enough. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I really went in for the extreme extreme, I would have bought a French one. Run for your lives, girls. The fleet sent. Oh, Uncle Lon, am I excited. Yipe! Encouraged by Johnny Hyde, Marilyn eagerly pursued publicity. She would be voted Miss Cheesecake of 1951. I first met Marilyn on the set of All About Eve, where we were all at Margot's. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I was very irritated at her, I must say, almost right away, because she kept us waiting almost an hour. And when she did arrive, she looked like this dear little sort of duckling of a girl, with blonde hair and pretty figure and unawareness, really, of um, the demands that were made upon most of us all the time, to be on time, to know our lines, to be ready when we were called. So, uh, but she seemed to be blithely unaware of this. And um, then she proceeded to, I remember the line about Somebody saying she called, but she called the waiter at the party, and I believe George Sanders said, and "That isn't the waiter, my dear. That's a butler." Well, I can't yell, "Oh, butler!" Can I? Maybe somebody's name is Butler. It was interesting because she did it right, but I wondered whether she was playing herself or whether she knew how funny she was. You have a point, an idiotic one, but a point. I don't want to make trouble. All I want is a drink. Leave it to me. I'll get you one. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Well done. I can see your career rising in the east like the sun. Signing her second contract with 20th Century Fox, Marilyn was given a succession of dumb blonde roles. To each, she added something unique. Johnny Hyde made all the difference for Marilyn. With his guidance, the name Marilyn Monroe began to be recognized, but he would not live to see her first real success. From now on, she'd have to go it alone. In the 1952 Clash by Night, Marilyn was more than the sweet, dumb blonde. It was a step into the future. Meanwhile, the past was waiting to entrap her. And I asked her once, I, I want to take some nudes of her. And she said, no, she said, can't do that. And I said, why? And she said, you're not married. So she went to another photographer who was married and did this famous nude. This photograph provoked a crisis of epic proportion. Studio heads considered delaying the opening of Clash by Night. Marilyn's explanation, she was broke and the job paid $50 gained her public sympathy, and audiences were soon trooping to see the film. Hey, May, look. Isn't it beautiful? A diamond. Oh. We had dinner last night, Joe and me. We had a fight, and we were never going to see each other again. At 11 o'clock, Joe came to the house and was going to kick the door down. I never thought I'd like a guy who pushed me around. Always take the man who kicked the door down. Advice from Mama. When I was 14, I couldn't wait to get married. I was in a hurry to see the world. Don't see it too fast, little bee. Why gotta go? I just had to show you the ring. Hey, wait a second. I'll get Gloria dressed and come with you. I can't, honey. Joe's waiting. Diamonds make me punctual. Peg. Critics agreed that with Clash by Night, a genuine talent was revealed. Marilyn's fan mail took a quantum leap, and the future looked bright. In the 1952 Don't Bother to Knock, Marilyn played a disturbed babysitter opposite a young actor named Richard Widmark. Look at that 
haven't any reason to leave now. Sure I have. I want to. But you should be quiet. It's not her. I've got an appointment. I have to be someplace by 10. I'll go with you. Thanks. I don't think that would work out. Let's go dancing. Take me down to that bar. Say, what's the matter with you? You're supposed to be here with that kid. Then stay. She won't bother you anymore. You bother me. I can't figure you out. You're, you're silk on one side and sandpaper on the other. I'll be anywhere you want me to be. Why? Why is it so important? Didn't you ever have the feeling that maybe without even knowing why, you just let somebody walk away from you? You'd be lost. You wouldn't know which way to turn or where to find anybody to take their place. Reviewers applauded Marilyn's performance, but audiences were surprised by the departure from her usual role. You stop it now, all of you! I should have known better. You're not cured. Don't you say that! Put that down. You're just like my folks. You want me put away again? Don't, Sans. It wasn't their fault. They didn't send you to that institution. The doctors did. Soon, Marilyn was back playing the blonde her growing public couldn't get enough of. She was on a roll, and each succeeding film seemed to bring stardom closer. the fire hose. In 1953, with Niagara, she was almost there. Would you mind playing this? Yeah, sure thing, lady. Kiss. Kiss me. Won't you kiss me? I like that song, don't you, Mrs. Lewis? There isn't any other song. With all your heart, protect us. This is a moment of thrill. It was that same year with Gentlemen Prefer Blondes that the perfect blending of actress and role was finally achieved. Marilyn Monroe, the star. Was born. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. You don't want to marry my son for his money? I want to marry him for your money. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat or help you at the automat. May I, uh, may I kiss your hand? I always say a kiss on the hand might feel very good, but a diamond tiara lasts forever. Men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Tiffany's. I'd like to present to you the Look Achievement Award as the most outstanding feminine newcomer. Cartier. Best young box office personality. So I present this citation to the most popular actress of the year. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mr. Sam. Black Star, Ross Gore. Talk to me, Harry Winston. Tell me all about it. Don't you know that a man being rich is like a girl being pretty. You might not marry a girl just because she's pretty, but my goodness, doesn't it help? <laughs> she thought that this whole lark of, of, of being a sex goddess or a glamour queen was just that. You know, she'd, she would uh, play it if that's what they wanted. And as a matter of fact, she burlesqued it, really, because she thought the whole thing was very, very funny. The rewards of stardom came pouring in. 
With Jane Russell, her co-star in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, she took her first step toward Hollywood immortality. When the actress was seen in the company of Joe DiMaggio, the popular retired baseball player, her place in America's heart seemed secure. In 1953, Marilyn starred in How to Marry a Millionaire with Lauren Bacall and the then reigning sex goddess, Betty Grable. Did you see this fellow I'm with? I saw him. What's he look like? Very nice for a one-eyed man. Is that all he's got? Well, what do you think he's got that patch on for? I didn't know it was a patch. I thought somebody might have belted him. In River of No Return, Marilyn was cast opposite an old friend, Robert Mitchum. You never return. At that time, uh, I didn't think she knew too many people who were very friendly to her. Growing up in an atmosphere of agents, directors, and journalists, she seemed uh, like a lost child. The whole thing to her, I mean, her position in this atmosphere was uh, like Alice in Wonderland. The whole thing was through the looking glass. She could not believe that anybody was really very serious about her. Where are you taking me? Home. Marilyn's long anticipated marriage to Joe DiMaggio in 1954 linked the Prince of Sport and the Princess of Movies in a union that seemed perfect. When a well known honeymoon couple arrives at Tokyo Airport, a throng of 4,000 baseball and movie fans surge out of control. The near riot of the baseball loving Japanese was for Marilyn rather than for their longtime hero. But their troubles aren't over. Next day comes a press conference where the public was barred, but the photographers and reporters more than made up for that. I ah, mean, never underestimate the power of you know who. From Japan, Marilyn traveled alone to entertain American troops in Korea. Marilyn would later describe this event as unequaled in her lifetime. Never before, she said, had she been showered with so much love. Marilyn, at her very, very height, uh, had achieved what every other actress in town would have given their eye teeth and everything else for. Uh, she had achieved that. There was no one, and Marilyn didn't even recognize it because Truly, highly recognized actresses wanted to talk to Marilyn, be seen with Marilyn, have, be photographed with Marilyn, uh, because she was getting that recognition that, that nobody got like she got. And yet, there's so little happiness with that. Why? Because first you want attention, but when you get attention, then you want respect. When I must have been 16 years old, I was in California with my mother, who traveled with me, doing shooting picnic. And I went on to 20th Century Fox, and Marilyn was shooting. There's no business like show business. She came over to my mother and I, and she said, oh, Mrs. Strasberg, something I've always wanted to meet your husband, and I would like to study acting. And of course, we just thought she was talking, and about Six months later, she showed up in New York. First, Marilyn was to make the 1955 movie, which confirmed for all time her role as the goddess who was all bubbles and sweet innocence. The seven-year itch. With this scene, the goddess created her own icon. Didn't you 
you just love the picture? I did. But I just felt so sorry for the creature. At the end. Sorry for the creature? Why'd you want him to marry the girl? He was kind of scary looking. But he wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection. You know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> oh, do you feel the breeze from the subway? Isn't it delicious? Marilyn's marriage to Joe DiMaggio had ended after only nine months. But her fans were still caught up with the pleasures that her special brand of innocent sexuality could bring. She really felt she didn't have the inner qualifications to fulfill the image of the sex goddess. As a comedian, I think she was very comfortable. But she... Uh, she thought that the, that the whole thing was a lie because it was not her. And uh, so she tried to wrap it up, and she was going to New York, and she went uh, to the actor's studio, and uh, she wanted to find some firm ground. And they begged her to stay, and they offered her more money, and they offered her anything that she wanted. And then she turned it all down, and they said to her, well, what do you want? And she said, I just want to be wonderful. Riding a pink elephant, she dazzled New York. But a new, more serious Marilyn was waiting in the wings. Here on 11 acres, Marilyn Monroe... On April 8, 1955, she was interviewed by Edward R. Murrow at the home of Milton Green, vice president of the newly formed Marilyn Monroe Productions. Uh, Marilyn, tell me, what's the basic reason for this corporation? Primarily to contribute to help making good pictures. Well, would it be fair to say that uh, you got rather tired of playing the same kind of roles all the time and, and wanted to try something different? I, it's, it's not that I object to doing musicals or comedies. In fact, I rather enjoy it. But I would like to do also dramatic parts, too. Mm -hmm. Well, Marilyn, now that you're a New Yorker, uh, how do you like this city, anyway? Oh, I love it. Everyone's very friendly, and it's a very optimistic, friendly yeah. city. <laughs> well, are, are you always recognized wherever you go in New York? Not really. Um, I can put on a no polo coat and no makeup and get along pretty well. John Springer was Marilyn's publicist for many years. I was completely involved through the actor's studio period. She was funny. She was a funny girl. I mean, people are treat her like a bubblehead. She wasn't. She was a very smart, witty, bright person. Well, Marilyn, speaking of measurements, are they still the same as when you left? Have you gained weight? Have you lost weight? Have you I think I'm about the same. About the same. Yes. Nobody has any complaints. <laughs> I don't know. Speak up, boys. <laughs> you're wearing a high head dress now. The last time I saw you were. Is this a new Marilyn, a new style? No, I'm the same person. But it's a different suit. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Strasberg and the Actors Studio stood for people like Marlon Brando and Montgomery Clift and Geraldine Page and Maureen Stapleton. The great, great people. For the first time, Marilyn took her life as an actress seriously because somebody had great faith in her as an actress. That's why the link with my father was so strong, was that he recognized in her that shining flame, which she did have. If you talk to people who saw her at the actor's studio when she, when she was on stage, you know, in, in life, she tended to have kind of a small quality, in other words, almost like a little girl quality, so that you wouldn't have imagined that on stage that would, that light would kind of enlarge, but it did, she, she glowed on stage. There were some surprises, like the revelation that Marilyn was seeing America's most respected playwright, Arthur Miller. And there had been another surprise, 
They were going to make the Brothers Karamazov into a film, and Marilyn said she wanted to be Grushenka. And she could have played it beautifully. But of course, everybody laughed at the pretension of this woman, this girl, this gentleman prefer blondes type, see, that she wanted to play great Russian drama. And I think the press began to ridicule her at that point. Do you feel you said you wanted to grow? Do you feel you have grown? <clears throat> well, I hardly know how to answer that since they misinterpret that meaning. I'm not. In inches or something. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't care because she knew what she was. By this point, she knew she was good. She knew she was, and she had never known. She had never been taken seriously. She had never been treated like anything but a kind of a beautiful idiot child. After only a year in New York, Marilyn's determination paid off. She received a new contract and a new power. Marilyn, are you happy to come back and do this picture? Are you pleased with the bus picture bus stop? Oh, yes, very much. I'm looking forward to working with Josh Logan and doing the picture, and it's good to be back. Is it, was he uh, your selection as a director? Uh, 20th Century Fox selected him, and... Um, I have director approval, and they asked if I would approve of him, and definitely you did. So you're, you're very happy. You think you're going to make a very good picture. I hope it will be a good picture. Marilyn Monroe, I said, I, she, she can't act, can she? But I had only seen her in these funny, flashy movies, where she sort of breathed hard and was very sexy. And, and Lee Strasberg said, well, she was the best actress outside of, best actor outside of Marlon Brando that we had. And this, I said, she was? So I went back, I said, would you excuse me just a minute? I went back to the back of the house and I called Hollywood and said, I'll do bus stop with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> She got all the ideas. She had the accent down perfect. It was a sort of a hillbilly southern accent. And she knew how to speak it so easily. She rehearsed it. And when they sent drawings to us for a, a show costume, she said, I do like that if we can just, you know, make it look real. I suddenly realized that she was a wonderful girl with great, imaginative, funny. She was a comedian. She was any kind of a serious actress that she wanted her to be. And she was not at all dumb. She was brilliant. She was just uneducated. When I first heard that I'd be working with Marilyn Monroe on Bus Stop, my expectations was to be working with a musical comedy actress. Marilyn had learned uh, tremendous dramatic and comedy technique uh, that didn't uh, depend just on her personality, but she could really get into a character and play it with great truth as well as humor. The last scene in Bus Stop, the last love scene, as a matter of fact, it wasn't the last scene, but the last love scene, where we come together and we have that kiss when I very seriously say to her, I sure wish you were coming back to the ranch with me, uh, Cherry. I wish that more than anything in the world, and she accepts my proposal. That scene was shot in extreme close-up. Well, I've been thinking about them other fellas, Cherry. And, uh, well, what I mean is, I like you the way you are, so what do I care how you got that way? Now remember that scene in particular because Josh Logan, the director, wanted that extreme close-up and the cinematographer said, you can't do that. 
on CinemaScope because it's too startling to the audience. And Logan said, I don't care. As long as you can get it in focus, I want it. They set it up, and the cinematographer said, the camera's cutting off the top of Don's head. It won't work. And Marilyn said that wonderful, famous line, which she actually said was not a publicist's dream. She said, so what? The audience knows Don has a top to his head. It's been established. <laughs> I still wish you was going back to the ranch with me more than anything I knew. You do? Yeah, I do. Well, I'd go anywhere in the world with you now. And she was just Sherry, that's all. She was so wonderful. I finally realized that I had a chance of working with the greatest artist I'd ever worked with in my life. And it was Marilyn Monroe. I couldn't believe it. Critics acknowledged Marilyn's Cherie as the finest performance of her career. But Hollywood ignored her achievement, failing even to nominate her for an Academy Award. Everyone is interested in your plans and that big question. Now, can you tell us where and when? It was 1956, and the improbable was about to take place. Uh, I'm not going to say where we will be married. For just that reason, because uh, I think it's time enough for everybody to know when it happens and to leave us with a little bit of peace until it happens. Arthur Miller's parents welcomed her, and Marilyn appeared once more to have found her family. Just days after their marriage, Marilyn and her new husband left for England to begin her company's second production. One day, Milton Green told me that he was going to make a picture of the prince and the showgirl, and Lawrence Olivier was going to play the prince and direct, and Marilyn Monroe was going to play opposite him. What do you think of that idea? I said, that's the most exciting combination since black and white. My dear, wouldn't you be more comfortable on the sofa? You could put your feet up there and rest. Oh, no, thank you. I think I'll stay right where I am. Just as you please. <laughs> My dear, it was so good of you to come and see me here tonight. You said that before. <laughs> Did I? That is a beautiful dress. You said that before, too. <laughs> what does it matter? What are words? Where deeds can say so much more. <laughs> That's just terrible. What is that? <laughs> the performance of yours. Dear, I do not altogether understand you, Miss Marina. Oh, now, don't pull the Grand Duke with me. You made a pass and I turned it down. That's all that happened. We can still be friendly. Marilyn, now in her 30s, was hailed by critics as a superb comedienne. She would receive Italy's David Di Donatello Award as Best Foreign Actress of 1958, as well as the French Crystal Star. I would like to say that I'm fully confident that in the end my husband will win this case. Americans were again amazed. Marilyn Monroe was speaking out in support of her husband's refusal to name suspected communists before a congressional committee. Her courage only enhanced her role as beloved sex goddess. The acclaim for Marilyn's unique comedic talent reached its peak with her 1959 film, Some Like It Hot, and the goddess of sex was at her playful best. Oh, it's freezing outside. 
me when I think about you and your poor ukulele. If there's ever anything I can do for you. I can think of a million things. That's one of them. Marilyn's attempt to have a child ended in repeated disappointment, and the old haunting sense of loneliness returned. Marilyn was so pretty, so she was the definitive example of the pretty, gorgeous, blonde, you wouldn't think she had a thought in her, in her head unless you knew her. She had too, too many thoughts in her head. Maybe that was part of her problem. In 1961, Arthur Miller wrote the last film Marilyn ever completed, The Misfits. Never had she seemed more fragile, more luminous. Real beautiful woman. It's almost kind of an honor sitting next to you. You just shine in my eyes. That's my true feeling, Rosalind. What makes you so sad? I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. This man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. That's because you make a man feel happy. I didn't feel that way about you, Kay. Well, don't get discouraged, girl. You might. Even though her marriage was coming to an end and her precarious health had caused delays in production, Marilyn's performance was acknowledged as one of her most brilliant. Another blow came soon after filming was completed. Clark Gable, her co-star, and the man she had idolized since childhood, died of a massive heart attack. I remember taking her out of the hospital at one point, and all the police couldn't keep that mob of people that were trying to get to her back. <laughs> And they weren't after me, they were after Marilyn, but I was scared. She wasn't what she sold. You don't realize when you're, you make these deals early in your life, and she certainly did uh, with publicity, that you have to live with them forever. And I don't think she was able to do it. I think one time she said, I'm so sick of being treated like a thing. I'll never forget, I woke up one morning and Marilyn was standing nude, looking out at the ocean. And I was sort of underneath the cover, staring at her with great envy, thinking that if I had a body like hers and blonde hair like hers and was tall like her, I would be happy. And she turned around and caught me watching her and I said, oh, Marilyn, I said, I, I would give anything to be like you. And she looked at me in a complete horror and consternation and said, oh, no, Susie, don't say that. I'd give anything to be like you. People respect you. Marilyn accepted her second Golden Globe Award. Norma Jean, the little girl from the Vine Street Orphanage, was declared the world's most popular star. And you can be as alone with Oscars and jewelry as uh, anybody. And the real values are your family and your friends. And Marilyn had it, no family. And uh, she was suspicious of most friends because they turned out to be using her. She had been practically cut out of her first film. Her last, Something Has to Give, she never finished. Frequent absences, lateness. For the first time ever, Marilyn was fired. The footage that remains shows the Marilyn we always knew. 
vibrant and gorgeous. But within weeks, her life would be over. The only house Marilyn ever owned is the one she purchased shortly before she died. It's not in the tradition of the Hollywood superstar. It's modest, in keeping with the needs of a private and introspective person. The inscription before the door is in Latin. Cursum perficio. My journey is over. I should think that if Marilyn could be aware of uh, the sort of legendary quality that, uh, that she herself inspired, I should think that no one would be more surprised than she because she never really felt worthy. She would feel that after her years of search that uh, she had been finally and truly adopted. There's never been anyone quite like Marilyn Monroe. She has elements that many other stars have. Of the people that I've been involved with, there's everyone from Judy Garland to Ingrid Bergman. Dreamy and soft and gentle would all be words that would personify what Marilyn was uh, and never ever would hurt you you would you could hurt her but she was not something that would ever threaten or hurt you even now I, I watch people watching her films and they become alive and uh, uh, she she uh, had that quality and she could project it it was uh, an earthy just magic that's why it's still there on the screen well i remembered reading the lyrics that i got in oscar hammerstein's book a wonderful lyric he wrote about all the things you are she is the angel glow that lights a star she was an electric light. She turned on and acted. Marilyn kind of distilled what makes the most exciting women in the world exciting. Marilyn had it all. 